Welcome to Fantasy Worlds at the British Library. Thank you so much for coming out. How many of you have been to the exhibition? Yes. If you haven't been, it's incredible. And I know I work here and I'm a bit biased, but it really is something. One of the items that's actually within the exhibition is the first illustrated edition of Frankenstein. Now, you may know that Frankenstein has a very strong family connection locally here to the British Library, more on which later, perhaps. Um, but I'm delighted to let you know that you really are in for a massive Frankenstein treat because we have all the way from Notre Dame University in the United States, Professor Eileen Hunt, who is a political theorist and expert speaker on Shelley, Wollstonecraft and Orwell. And much like Frankenstein um, animating and galvanising his creature, what Eileen does in her writing is to take writers and stories that you think you know really well, and then she reanimates them, and she imbues them with completely new life, new meaning, and new relevance, which is why her writing is so very exciting, and why I love her books, some of which are on sale outside in the shop. So be sure to knock yourselves out and buy those books after the event Eileen will be signing. Just before I hand over, I wanted to say a really special welcome to our friends on the Living Knowledge Network. Hello, Living Knowledge Network, which is the British Library's lovely community of other libraries around the country. Um, Leeds, one of our uh, partner libraries, has sent in a beautiful picture of a, a dog, a friendly dog in the audience. So I just wanted to say hi to Leeds and to everyone else that's joining us um, with our friends, the Living Knowledge Network. But for now, please join me in a huge Huge and rousing applause for Eileen Hunt. You all already know what Mary Shelley is most famous for, her creation of the hulking eight-foot monster known as Frankenstein's creature who is made by a scientist from the body parts of dead humans and other animals, only to be tragically abandoned by his maker to lead a life of misery, misanthropy, rebellion, and revenge. What you might not know yet is that Mary Shelley is also responsible for creating the archetypal image of the seemingly last human survivor of an apocalyptic disaster. Today I will show you how Mary Shelley forged this fantasy of individual survival against all odds. She did so by writing and publishing two more innovative works of science fiction and fantasy literature after Frankenstein, which she had published in 1818 at age 21. While a young, grieving widow and a single mother in her mid-twenties, Mary Shelley went on to publish, in 1826, the first major modern post-apocalyptic pandemic novel about the near extinction of the human species, The Last Man. As a self-supporting woman writer in her early 30s, she produced the 1832 gothic romance, The Invisible Girl, a mass-marketed short story about an abused and abandoned orphan girl who en endures isolation and despair to prove that love is always stronger than death. I have drawn today's talk from my forthcoming book, The First Last Man, Mary Shelley and the Post-Apocalyptic Imagination which will be the concluding volume in my trilogy on Mary Shelley and political philosophy for Penn Press. The first two volumes applied ethical insights drawn from Frankenstein and The Last Man to engage with contemporary debates on children's rights, genetic engineering, and artificial intelligence. The final volume pans out to address a cosmic question, the big question of our time of war disease, and environmental crisis. That is, what should people do after a massive human-made disaster that threatens the existence of life itself? In this talk, I address this existential question by showing how the overlapping phantasms of Frankenstein's creature, the last man, and the invisible girl came to haunt black and feminist 
dystopian and post-apocalyptic fantasy literature. Since the early 19th century, through their reception in literary, visual, and musical arts, these three images have transmogrified into the specter of the invisible woman, or final girl survivor. Shelley's many layered gift to fantasy literature is this marginalized, lonely, yet resilient figure who signifies the struggles of oppressed people to gain recognition of their human rights in the wake of devastating personal and political disasters. Shelley published Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, anonymously in January 1818. About 18 months earlier, in June 1816, the unmarried teenage mother had conceived the horrifying story of Victor Frankenstein and his creature. It was a dark and stormy night on the shores of Lake Geneva during the year without a summer. While visiting her friend, Lord Byron, at his majestic rental property, the Villa Diodati, she had a waking nightmare. The skies were black and rainy due to the eruption of Mount Tambura in Indonesia the year before. Volcanic ash and dust had darkened the Earth's atmosphere from Asia to Europe to North America. Rain and even snow fell steadily in Central Europe in the summer of 1816, causing some to starve and others to migrate en masse. Shelley was lucky to be safe in relative luxury. Alongside her fabulous host, the hedonistic poet in exile, Lord Byron, she had an eccentric cast of companions in Geneva, her lover, the married poet, notorious atheist, and radical Republican, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Byron's dashing young doctor, the writer John Polidori, her beloved baby son, William, also nicknamed Will Mouse, her stepsister, Claire Claremont, who was tragically in love with both of the polyam polyamorous poets, Percy and Byron. They all huddled together inside the Villa Diodati one evening to escape the rain, to entertain themselves or to perhaps stay out of trouble. The group of rebellious romantic writers decided to hold a ghost story competition. Though the other writers hatched stories quickly, including Byron's tale of a vi vampiric sexual predator, much like himself, that went on to influence both Polidori's and Bram Stoker's influential dark fantasies of aristocratic blood suckers. Mary Shelley went to bed without having conceived a ghost story yet. As she recounted in her 1831 introduction to Frankenstein, the only edition over which she had total authorial and editorial control, she had a waking nightmare while the eerie moonlight streamed through her window by the lake. She felt possessed by a vision of a scientist making a human being who was then horrified by his morbid creation coming to life. This image of the scientist before his creation, paired with the awestruck declaration, it's alive, has become iconic on the stage and screen, beginning with the earliest theatrical adaptations of the novel in 1820s Paris and London especially since the British director, James Whale, created the first full-length feature film of Frankenstein for Universal Studios in 1931, it has become a staple meme of the modern fantasy and horror genres. Beyond her nightmarish vision of Frankenstein's creature, Mary Shelley's other dark and complex legacies for politics, literature, and the arts include the overlapping ideas of the last man the last woman and the invisible girl. After losing a premature infant, two toddlers, including her beloved Will Mouse, as well as a young niece to disease, a foster child to an unknown illness, and her husband, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, to drowning, Mary Shelley felt completely abandoned and alone. As a 24-year-old widow with one surviving child, she buried herself in the intensive study of three Greek tragedies about plague, infection, and love. Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, and Philoctetes, and Euripides' Alcestis. Her transcriptions and translations of Sophocles informed her authorship of her pandemic novel, set in the year 2100, 
about the near extinction of the human species through war, disease, and corruption. Alcestis shaped her Gothic romance about a woman's heroic survival of trauma and abuse to bring about the resurrection of her lost love against all odds. Published six years before The Invisible Girl, Shelley's novel The Last Man yielded the iconic image of a heroic survivor who narrates the history of an apocalyptic disaster in order to save humanity, if not as a species, then at least as the practice of compassion or humaneness. In visual and musical arts from 1826 to the present, this post-apocalyptic figure has evolved from the last man into the globally familiar filmic images of the invisible man and the final girl. In early 1823, Shelley wrote an unfinished biography of her late husband, Percy Shelley, and her life with him, which she described in her Journal of Sorrow as romantic beyond romance. She never published the biography due to an ongoing legal struggle with her aristocratic father-in-law over the use of the Shelley name in her publications. She did, however, go on to write The Last Man, which was originally subtitled A Romance. Rooted in, us, in Arthurian and court romance literature, her pandemic novel begins with the story of five interconnected love triangles tied to the English royal family at Windsor Castle in the 2070s. This romantic fantasy is a Ramana clef that allegorizes her life with Percy and their circle of friends and artists in the second generation of British Romanticism. Even as her pandemic novel dramatizes both the beauties and the tragedies of her romantic life with Percy, The Last Man illustrates how plagues, both literal and figurative, spread due to the deprivation of the things that make life worth living. Above all, love. Shelley's speculative fiction about the near extinction of the human species trains the mind's eye to consider how the want of conditions for love brings to humanity the worst miseries it can suffer. The Last Man is a war and plague novel, partly based on Shelley's experience of the death of her friend, Lord Byron, from sepsis contracted on the field of war in Greece in the battle for Greek independence. Byron's alter ego in the novel is Lord Raymond, whose philandering betrayal of both his wife and his lover leads him to abandon his political leadership of Republican Britain to fight for Greek independence and die in the rubble of Constantinople. With Lord Raymond's tragic fate, Shelley suggests that interpersonal conflict causes the want of love, which in turn exacerbates other human wants, such as peace, health, happiness, and justice. Shelley thus gave a relational and emotional response to the problem of human strife that resonates with feminist political philosophy today. As the leading feminist theorist of gender, Judith Butler has argued in the aftermath of COVID-19, quote, a world in which such viral threat and destruction is possible raises the very question of life. What does it mean to live as a living creature, a creature among creatures, a life among living processes under conditions such as these, unquote. Shelley might have asked with a sharper, Byronic, even vi vampiric edge, can life retain meaning when human strife drains it of love? The Last Man addresses this existential and political question with the symbolic rise of a plague during a war between Greece and Turkey and Constantinople in the year 2092. The Greeks' military strategy is to besiege their Turkish enemies behind city walls during intolerable heat. It succeeds but at the cost of causing famine, scarcity, bad quality of food, suffering, waste and riot, the scourge of disease, and then a lethal epidemic that threatens to wipe out the human species. Akin to her 21st century eco-feminist successor in science fiction and plague literature, Octavia Butler, Shelley grasped that humans and their technology can and do shape and potentially destroy the whole environment through artifice. Even disasters that appeared purely natural, such as extreme weather, 
were artificially made more miserable and deadly by human intervention and conflict. As she filled the five extant volumes of her journals from 1814 to 1844, Shelley kept returning to consider, with an ever-deepening maturity, a series of questions that we now associate with the modern existentialist tradition, particularly with the author of the 1947 novel La Peste, Albert Camus. Like Camus after her, Shelley used writing and storytelling to dare to ask things that were thought to be taboo. And like Camus, she dared to push her existential life and death questions on pestilence to the point of asking, with all of its horrors, should life be lived at all? And if it should be lived, could life be lived well? Whether alone or in community with others, while overshadowed by the plagues of war, disease, and consciousness of mortality. Ancient Greek literature proved to be a source and solace for Shelley in her existential ruminations about the meaning of life in the shadow of death and conflict. From her study of ancient Greek since 1814 and her participation in both established and nonconformist reformed Christian churches in England and Scotland, including the Glazite Church in Dundee, she knew the original meaning of apocalypse, apocalypsis, that is, a revelation unveiling or uncovering. As with the ancient Athenian playwright Sophocles, whose Oedipus Rex she transcribed and translated in full, Shelley was more interested in what is revealed by and after a series of man-made disasters than in speculating any final or absolute end to the consequences of human faults and failures. This made her, like Sophocles, a post-apocalyptic political thinker, a writer who used the darkness of the imagination to uncover the wisdom of how not to live after the witness or endurance of a seeming catastrophe. By the 14th of May, 1824, Shelley had explicitly identified with the solitary being of the last man in her journal of sorrow, as she was in the thick of composing her pandemic novel. Then, on the 15th of May, 1824, an eerie and tragic irony befell Shelley. The very next day, after she wrote this diary entry on the screen, in which she compared herself to the last man, with all her companions extinct before her, she received the news that her friend Lord Byron had also died young of sepsis contracted on the field of war in Greece. The loss of this towering public figure and literary collaborator only reinforced her self-image as the last woman of the second generation of British romanticism, as impressed in her journal of sorrow since her first year of widowhood. Between September of 1822 and the end of 1825, when she conceived, composed, and proofed her plague novel, Shelley consistently rooted the concept for The Last Man in her personal manuscripts, in her memories of the lives and deaths of Percy Bysshe Shelley, their children, and Lord Byron. She did not want posterity to miss that she, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley, was not merely the author, but the living mind from whence the unprecedented plot had been drawn. When she wrote the quasi-autobiographical preface for the novel, she had the unnamed woman narrator relate in her first-person voice how she discovered and reassembled the fragments of a prophecy found in a cave near Naples on the 8th of December, 1818. This prophecy, she implies, is the story of the last man to survive a near-extinction event for the human species in the late 21st century. Although the prophecy of the last man at the core of her pandemic novel is fictional, Shelley had in fact visited the cave of the ancient Sibyl of Baye on the 8th of December, 1818, with Percy and her stepsister Claire. She recorded this journey in her second journal book less than two months after the death of her second infant daughter, Clara. By rooting her pandemic novel's title and preface in her private manuscripts and journals of misfortune and sorrow, 
Shelley left open the possibility of interpreting the narrator of her global plague tragedy on two levels at once. As a historical woman, the famous author Mary Shelley, and as well as her fictional male avatar, the self-described last man, Lionel Verney. Soon after the 1826 publication of her allegorical plague novel, Shelley's post-apocalyptic figure of the last man became associated with her own notoriously tragic life story, especially her youthful losses of family, friends, and literary collaborators. Her idea of the last man almost immediately transformed into the idea of the last woman in popular media of the period. Just a month after the last man's publication in January 1826, a reviewer cruelly asked why the author, who had outlived her husband, did not simply call her novel and herself the last woman. In May 1826, the Glasgow-based satirical cartoonist William Heath issued an intentionally offensive depiction of the last woman as a black woman slave. The first known work of visual art based on Shelley's The Last Man, pictured here and discovered here in the British Library, employed the novel's post-apocalyptic setting to make an overtly racist and misogynistic point. If an international war or other global disaster wiped out all but one woman, men of all nations and races would fight to the death to possess her, no matter if she were an African slave. Heath could be read as mocking men as much as women and whites as much as people of color, but either way, the artist crudely exploited gender and race stereotypes perpetuated by British imperial politics of the Georgian era. In the editorial commentary on the cartoon, emphatically titled The Last Woman, the artist drew a telling commentary uh, in parallel between the black woman and the widowed author of The Last Man. Heath wanted to draw the likeness of the all-engrossing Mary Shelley, perhaps to hint at her unorthodox past among the poetic and atheistic lords of creation of British Romanticism, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron. But he refrained from directly caricaturing Shelley because it would have caused a row. Instead, he depicted the absolutely final woman on earth as one who would otherwise be the last to go off the marriage market. The commentary salaciously implied that the reverse was true in the case of Mrs. S, for she was early to go on the market when she eloped with a married man at age 16. In his satirical cartoon of Shelley's The Last Man, the double-edged quality of the humor meant that women, especially black women, got the last laugh. The image suggested that in some future anarchistic state of war, such as in Shelley's 21st century plague novel, men would fight to the death over women, leaving a single black woman to survive and potentially start life anew on the planet. In an ironic reversal, she would be alone and freed from the twin chains of slavery and patriarchy. If she had seen his caricature, Shelley might have smirked for she had written a story that was widely recognized as an allegory for the rising struggle against chattel slavery. In a March 1824 letter to her friend Edward Trelawney, she said she was pleased that the Foreign Secretary George Canning paid a compliment to Frankenstein as the British Parliament debated legislation for the amelioration of the state of the slaves in some parts of the West Indies. In this way, Mary Shelley's dystopian novels, Frankenstein and The Last Man, carried forward the abolitionist tradition of her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, whose anti-slavery arguments were printed in a Jamaican newspaper in the run-up to the massive slave rebellion of the Haitian Revolution in 1791. 35 years later, Shelley may have felt like the last woman, but she was never truly alone for she was a vital part of an international tradition of utopian feminist abolitionist thought, dating back to her mother's generation in the time of the French and Haitian revolutions. In an ironic coincidence in Heath's dystopian cartoon of the last woman, the hidden and likely unintended utopia is not so different from the apparatic or open-ended ending of Shelley's pandemic novel. For Lionel Verney, 
the male avatar for the female author, is the last to go off in search of other survivors with whom to remake the human condition and hopefully restore peace and justice on Earth. As the female author behind this hopeful figure of the last man, Shelley played the parallel role of a real world survivor in search of social justice on a global scale. The leading black woman author in 20th century science fiction, Octavia Butler, was a reader of Shelley who often paid homage to Frankenstein in her award-winning novels and short stories. Butler's Parable series, published in the 1990s, also made explicit the feminist and anti-racist point of the post-apocalyptic plotline of The Last Man. Butler envisioned a teenage girl survivor, Lauren Alamina, leading the way out of the crime and plague-written birding city of Los Angeles into a brighter post-apocalyptic future on the anarchistic frontier of Northern California in the early 2020s. This last, or rather lasting, woman was a black woman who had endured everything in order to lead others to justice. Back in early 1826, the public's gendered reception of the title of her pandemic novel seems to have, to have provoked Shelley to develop yet another version of the last woman trope, a surviving man and woman who live as a pair to tell the tale of enduring a common chain of tragedies. Although she had her analog, Verney, the titular last man, set out to search for a saved pair of lovers, she did not bring this post-apocalyptic trope fully to life until she wrote her gothic romance, the, the Invisible Girl. Published for a largely female audience in the mass-marketed annual Christmas anthology, The Keepsake, in late 1832, the story unspools the mystery of how the orphan Rosina appears to rise from the dead to reunite with her betrothed, who is haunted by both his father's blocking of their marriage and by an uncanny sense of the girl's lasting presence in a seaside tower near his family estate in Wales. This romantic ghost story contains an allusion to the ancient Greek mythological furies, or fates, the Eumenides, which calls to mind Euripides' tragedy by the same name. But since she partly transcribed and translated his Alcestis after 1825, it seems more likely that Shelley paid homage to, Eurip to Euripides' archetypal tale of romantic resurrection in writing The Invisible Girl. His darkly comic play dramatizes the ancient Greek myth about the bride Alcestis, who gives up her life to save her new husband, then unexpectedly returns from Hades to reunite with him with the help of Hercules. J.C. Edwards' 1832 engraving for The Invisible Girl, pictured on the right, reinforces Shelley's poetic association of invisibility with the solitude of being a woman writer reader who has lost the intellectual and romantic companion to whom she had communicated her innermost thoughts. In the story, this portrait is painted before Rosina is banished into the Welsh wilderness and disconnected from her betrothed. The surviving artwork later decorates the tower where Rosina rediscovers her lover Henry. He then adorns the painting with the inscription, The Invisible Girl, as a testament to her death-defying will to regain visibility among the living, both in the restored painting in the story and in the story's actual frontispiece, Shelley's Invisible Girl is the original, fictional, lasting woman. She outlasts loneliness and despair by raising herself from the appearance of death to find love in life again. Shelley's journals illuminate the gradual evolution of a psychological parallel between herself and the 1832 illustration. The opening entry in her Journal of Sorrow, dated the 2nd of October, 1822, is Shelley's first extant piece of diaristic writing since Percy's death in early July of that year. As she began to fill the white paper of this new volume, she reflected with irony on how, quote, gifted I had been in being united to one whom I could unveil myself and who could understand me, unquote, only to be left to feel unseen and unknowable except by herself in her literary labors. In this melancholic light, 
the 1832 illustration's historical analog is not the almost suicidal widow who composed the Journal of Sorrow, but rather the woman who eventually made peace with her life and all its hardships during her 30s and early 40s. This is when Shelley gains strength and serenity from raising her only surviving child into his young adulthood. By crafting her editorial commentaries on Percy's poetical works and essays, letters from abroad, translations and fragments, which she published in 1839 to 1840, she imbued his poetry and other writing with new layers of insights from her lived experience as a woman, writer, translator, wife, widow, and mother. By meditating on her personal experiences of loss in the slower paced fifth and final volume of her journals, she came to accept her personal history as more than tragedy. For its darkness was the source of her imagination, which gave the world Frankenstein, The Last Man, The Invisible Girl, and her other fertile works of fiction and nonfiction. Through her journaling and editing, the once reclusive widow made her life visible again, on her own terms, both for herself and the public. From her ringlets and sleeve puffs to her scholarly posture and slight smile, the restored portrait of Rosina as the invisible girl even bears a striking likeness to the unknown sitter in an 1831 painting by Samuel John Stump, pictured on the left. Some have, th some have said that this writer is the 34-year-old Mary Shelley, who had just published the third edition of Frankenstein. The 1831 edition of Frankenstein was a literary milestone because the author, for the first time, had complete editorial and authorial control over its contents. The first anonymous edition of 1818 featured an anonymous preface by Percy recounting the night of ghost stories that inspired the novel and foregrounding the Godwinian premise that people are not born monsters but are rather made evil by the conflicts and injustices they suffer in society. The preface, alongside the book's dedication to William Godwin, soon led readers to suspect that the politically radical and atheistic poet was the author of the book. Not to be outdone by Percy, Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, produced the second edition of 1823 with his daughter's name on the cover, but without her oversight. Writing the autobiographical preface to the third edition of 1831 finally gave the author of Frankenstein the opportunity to tell her story of the novel's conception, as she tartly put it, in my own mind. While she was once the invisible girl behind Frankenstein's creation, it was always her book, made in the dark recesses of her imagination, and she, at last, had made that fact visible. The reprinting of Mary Shelley's Invisible Girl in her tales and stories in London in 1891 meant that it informed the peak decade of Victorian Gothic and SF literature, led by her readers Bram Stoker and H.G. Wells. The year 1897 alone saw the invention of two of the leading monsters of modern English literature after Frankenstein's Creature, with the publication of Stoker's Dracula and Wells's Invisible Man. Shelley's gothic prototypes of the invisible girl and the last man as lone and lonely survivors of disaster seem to have filtered into the now globally familiar idea of the invisible man. Traces of invisible and last men kept reappearing in milestone works of fiction and film. From the 1933 Universal Monster movie adaptation of Wells' Invisible Man, directed by James Whale, to the black existentialist novels by Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison, the parallel concept of the last woman rooted in Shelley's life story, contributed to iconic 20th century artistic images of the last or final girl who survives a man-made disaster on her own. From Muriel Sparks' 18, um, 1958 desert island novel, Robinson, and Lorraine Hansberry's 1959 Broadway hit, A Raisin in the Sun to the 1996 debut of the Scream Horror Satire film series and the 2020 feminist reboot of the 1930s Invisible Man movie franchise. Regardless of their gender, the real heroes in these disaster narratives are the ones who choose love 
despite the prospect of losing everyone and everything that matters to them. Writing this unexpectedly hopeful and malleable ending for the horror stories of human existence was Shelley's intellectual gift to the traditions of post-apocalyptic political thought, existential philosophy, dystopian fiction, and plague literature. After World War II, Mary Shelley and the Last Man resurfaced in literary criticism with the 1951 publication of a major biography of her life by the Scottish poet and novelist Muriel Spark. Spark included an appendix with a long synopsis of Shelley's plague novel. Then in 1954, Spark produced an introduction for the first modern edition of the novel by Falcon Press. Unfortunately, the press shut down after printing only six review copies. One of them, however, made it into the Bodleian Library with a note from the publisher suggesting he thought it was worthy of, of preservation. The next edition of The Last Man would have to wait until 1965 when the University of Nebraska Press published a scholarly edition. <clears throat> the same year, the influential American literary critic Harold Bloom noted the importance of Sparks' biography of Shelley as well as the Last Man for his scholarship on Frankenstein, apocalyptic literature, romanticism, and the Shelleys. Before 1965, The Last Man had not been fully released in a new and widely available edition until 1833, when Edgar Allan Poe probably purchased it alongside Frankenstein from his publishers Carey, Lay, and Blanchard in Philadelphia. Scholars have traced how the themes of Shelley's twin political science fiction novels, as well as the poetry of her husband, shaped some of his classic works of suspense and horror, including his 1833 short story, MS Found in a Bottle, which paraphrases the ending of Frankenstein. Shelley and Poe's combined impact on the modern horror and SF genres cannot be underestimated, as their American heir apparent, Stephen King, has often observed. The 1964 film Mask of the Red Death, starring Vincent Price, helped to usher in the 20th century cinematic fascination with plagues of death. From the 1964 film The Last Man on Earth, also starring Price, to the 1994 and 2020 television miniseries of King's own epic post-apocalyptic plague novel The Stand, to the much-anticipated HBO miniseries based on the popular action-adventure game The Last of Us. In addition, the multitudinous adaptation of the Frankenstein story for the cinema since the 1910s led to the rediscovery of Shelley's mother, Wollstonecraft's life and works by feminist scholars in the 1960s and 1970s. Shelley, in turn, became a leading 20th century icon of the modern Gothic woman writer, rivaled only by the Bronte sisters. Long preceding its success in cinema and television, the cultural canonization of Shelley's post-apocalyptic Gothic aesthetic was originally accomplished through its adaptation into two important post-apocalyptic works of plague literature, the black British writer M.P. Shields 1901 novel, The Purple Cloud, and Richard Matheson's 1954 novel, I Am Legend. Shields' novel is notable for introducing a recurring comic and romantic twist to the tragedy, wherein the seeming last man meets and falls in love with the apparent last woman, making him visible again to humanity, and is humanity again visible. Shelley and Shields' novels were also successfully translated for the screen and stage, beginning with the 1924 comic silent movie and Broadway musical, The Last Man on Earth, and extending to the 1959 Hollywood doomsday film, The World, the Flesh, and the Devil, starring the black superstar actor, singer, civil rights advocate, Harry Beller Belafonte. But it was Matheson's novel about the last man in the world to survive a vampire plague that has secured the ongoing reception of the last man trope in contemporary SF and horror literature, cinema, and television. It effectively combined the gothic plot lines of Dracula, Frankenstein, and the last man with the existentialist ideas of Camus, Nietzsche, and Dostoevsky. Matheson's proximate source for adapting the plot of The Last Man was M.P. Shields' 1901 novel, The Purple Cloud, 
about a poisonous gas that instigates humanity's self-destruction through war and other conflict. In a romantic version of the operatic ending of The Last Man, Scheele had the last man abandon his misanthropy when he stumbles upon a female survivor in Seer, buried in the ruins of Constantinople, with whom he falls in love. In a direct nod to Shelley, he framed the entire story as a Sibylline prophecy, as she had presented the last man as her latest discoveries in the slight Sibylline pages that she supposedly discovered in a cave near Naples in December 1818. Blending elements of Stoker, Scheel, and Shelley as refracted through filmic versions of their novels, Matheson imagined a post-apocalyptic America in which all but one human has been turned into a vampire by a bioengineered plague. This lone man, Robert Neville, quarantines himself in a bunker to fight off the invaders until he encounters a woman with whom he falls in love. She turns out to be a vampire, <laughs> sent to stop his hunting of her fellow infected humans, as he awaits execution by the new people in power, Neville ultimately realizes that he is the aberration, or monster, not the vampires, for he is the last of the old race of humans. However, Matheson's version of the last man narrative had disturbing racist undertones. If the black British writer, Shields, Purple Cloud, was the story of how a man and a woman from different cultures could remake society after the demise of a racist world, built on conflicts between white and black powers, then Matheson's I Am Legend was the story of the last white man's anxiety about the loss of his supposed race superiority over people of color. After its initial adaptation as the 1964 Hollywood film, The Last Man on Earth, starring the king of horror, Vincent Price, Matheson's version of the last man narrative begot the Night of the Living Dead, the Omega Man, 28 Days Later, I Am Legend, and countless other post-nuclear, pandemic, and zombie apocalypse movies and television series after them. Another less obvious but potent line of influence from Shelley's The Last Man to modern monster cinema is through its overlapping thematic reception with her 1832 short story, The Invisible Girl, and her devoted reader, H.G. Wells' 1897 novels, The War of the Worlds and The Invisible Man. Especially in the post-apocalyptic and horror genres, the image of the last woman or final girl survivor of trauma and disaster has flourished alongside the image of the invisible girl who endures abuse, isolation, and despair to find her way out of darkness to freedom, love, community, and justice. Wells's The War of the Worlds ends with a reference to Thomas Hood's 1826 satirical poem, The Last Man, where the, where the narrator discovers that the aliens have been defeated by the Earth's microbes. The last man left alive, hurrah! The last man left alive, he chants, forgetting in his, in his delirium that other people around the world must have had the same ecstatic grasp of their survival. Then he composes himself and continues in search of his wife. Wells knew Frankenstein, for he directly referenced its title in the opening pages of the manuscript for his novel about making human-animal hybrids through science, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Published a year later, his novel, The Invisible Man, features another riff on the idea that Victor Frankenstein, not his creature, was the real monster. The megaloma megalomaniac griffin uses science to turn himself invisible so that, so that he might enact crime, mind games, and other forms of tyranny upon vulnerable others, stripping them of their human rights as he strips off his publicly accountable civic identity. <clears throat> In the early 1940s United States, Richard Wright developed an influential strand of black existentialism from this image of the monstrous, meaning invisible and alienated man. His 1940 novel, Native Son, like Camus' The Stranger two years after it, features an outcast like Frankenstein's creature who becomes a murderer due to his sense of estrangement from society and humanity itself. In Wright's version of Shelley's gothic horror story, it is racism and poverty that triggers the young American black protagonist, Bigger Thomas's resort to a desperate and tragic life of crime. 
right, amplified the Dostoevskian and Shelleyan themes of his black existentialism in his influential 1942 short story, The Man Who Lived Underground, which was only published in its original unexpurgated form as a novel in 2021. After reading an August 1941 true to through detective report of a Los Angeles man who staged a series of burglaries from an underground bunker. Wright composed a novella about a black man, Fred Daniels, who escapes into the sewers after being tortured by the police for a crime he did not commit. In his memoir of writing the 1941 manuscript for the novel The Man Who Lived Underground, from which he excerpted the eponymous 1942 short story, Wright cited Russian literature and the movie's depicting the antics of invisible men as his major literary inspirations beyond the true crime report. In the spring of 1942, Ralph Ellison read an excerpt of Wright's story in the accent and sent a note to congratulate the publisher. A decade later, Ellison went on to publish his own Invisible Man novel, another classic of black existentialism and post-apocalyptic literature. Building on Wright and W.E.B. Du Bois before him, Ellison explores the ways that racism is an unseen yet oppressive force in American society that renders the true selves or souls of black folk invisible to others, including themselves, because of the socially prescribed color line that separates and elevates whites above people of color and culture and law. Ellison's Invisible Man famously began and ended with an unnamed black narrator living off the grid. He identifies as an invisible man, unseen by the racist society that refused to see who he really was because it systematically denied him the education, economic opportunities, and citizenship rights that he deserved in order to develop and share his talents with his nation and humanity itself. Making explicit what Wright had left implicit in The Man Who Lived Underground, Ellison opened Invisible Man with an allusion to the Hollywood movie ectoplasms of the 1930s. While neither American writer directly cited Wells as a source, the Universal Monster movies had turned his 1897 novel into a mainstay of mid-century global popular culture. Given his fascination with Shelley and literature in the 1890s, Wells could have also sought out her gothic romance, The Invisible Girl, in the 1891 edition of her Tales and Stories prior to writing The Invisible Man. Since James Whale directed Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and Bride of Frankenstein for Universal Studios in the early 1930s, the imagery of Shelley's and Wells's masterpieces of post-apocalyptic Gothic literature commingled in the cinematic imagination in the interwar and post-war eras. From Hollywood, images of invisible, last, and lonely men infuse the classics of black existentialism by Wright and Ellison. Playing with the growing post-war and post-nuclear fascination with the idea of the last man as an underground man, cut off from the toxic atmosphere of the outside world by hiding in a sewer pit or cellar, Matheson's horror SF novel, I Am Legend, was pivotal for the development of the mid-century iteration of post-apocalyptic Gothic literature and film. The casting of Will Smith as the hero in the 2007 film adaptation turned I Am Legend into a post-civil rights allegory for the lasting, isolating, and largely unseen struggle of black folks' bare survival of the plague of racism. The 2007 film makes explicit what Wright and Ellison left implicit. The black man is both the last man and the invisible man, while the white man is the vampire plague that seeks to make black people in their culture not only unseen, but extinct. A close reader of Du Bois, Wright, Beauvoir, and Wollstonecraft, the black Marxist playwright Lorraine Hansberry used the mid-century modern feminist trope of the last woman in her 1959 Broadway play, A Raisin in the Sun. The young black heroine, Benifa, takes after Hansberry herself. He grew up near the University of Chicago in historically segregated neighborhoods. Benita seeks to escape the racism of her South Side Chicago upbringing by going to Africa to be a doctor with her fiance. When her mother tries to persuade her to stay to marry another man with some loot, 
she proclaims, I wouldn't marry him if he was Adam and I was Eve. Hansberry's Benitha echoes a comic theme found in the 1924 silent film, The Last Man on Earth, and subsequent film and Broadway musicals based on it in Scheele's romantic riff on Shelley's novel. Uh, in the film and the Broadway plays based on it, Elmer proposes to his girlfriend Hattie only to have her turn him down, saying she wouldn't marry him if he was the last man left on the planet. Then a plague strikes, killing all men but Elmer, <laughs> and leaving him the last available man for women, including Hattie, to fight over. Benita rewrites this absurdist and sexist Hollywood punchline, however, by asserting her black womanly authority over her plan to blend love and vocation in her own unfolding life story, refusing to become another victim of systematic American racism and sexism. She departs for Africa to become a doctor with her lover and thereby exits her mother's and society's limiting script for her and other black women. With the feminist icon Elizabeth Moss in the starring role, the 2020 movie remake of Wells's and Wales' Invisible Man dramatized on screen the domestic violence themes implicit to the original Gothic story. The film opens with a woman escaping a glass house on the coast where her abusive boyfriend sleeps, surrounded by strange scientific equipment. Like Griffin and Wells's novel, the tyrant has learned to turn himself invisible. In a dystopian feminist twist, the invisible man does not seek power over the whole world, but rather only over his girlfriend. He uses a technological cloak of invisibility to both perpetuate and escape culpability for psychological and physical violence towards his sexual partner. In a second feminist twist, the female survivor uses her ex-boyfriend's stolen technology to make herself invisible. She manipulates her murderous ex into trusting her, then uses her cloak of invisibility to slit his throat, all while the police are waiting outside. With her cloak packed in her bag, Moss, as the invisible woman, finally leaves the glass house unscathed and undetected. By stopping the violence of the invisible man, the invisible woman becomes the last woman standing. This smart yet scary 2020 update of the 1930s Invisible Man films uncannily recalls the themes of Shelley's prototypical gothic romance, The Invisible Girl. In, a, in Shelley's 1832 short story, the orphan Rosina flees into the woods to barely subsist on her own after her adoptive family discovers that she is secretly engaged to her father's only son. She lives like a ghost to escape the cruel tyranny of her adoptive father and aunt who want to block her betrothal to the eldest male heir in the family. Rosina, Rosina only becomes visible to society again after she reunites with her shipwrecked lover, Henry, in an abandoned tower on the coast of Wales. She, Henry creates a memorial in the tower to his wife's enduring identity as a once lonely yet ever valiant survivor of domestic tyranny. He restores a portrait from their happy courtship, names it the Invisible Girl, and hangs it in the tower as a marker of her heroism. By allowing the invisible girl to finally triumph over the abuse that had threatened her very existence, both Shelley's 1832 short story and the 2020 film insist that the true horror would be to let domestic abuse remain invisible to a society that ought to prevent, prosecute, and overcome it. Made mainstream by The Invisible Man, Halloween, Alien, Scream, and other horror movie franchises, the Last Woman, The Invisible Woman, and The Final Girl tropes represent the still visionary idea that the civil and political rights of women and other oppressed people are integral to the final realization of human rights on a global scale. These unforgettable political images of human liberation are Shelley's lasting gift to fantasy and political science fiction literature even now. Thank you very much.
yeah, shall I shall I go for an online one first? Um, this is a question from Ellie. It says, what effect has the COVID pandemic had on the way we read plague literature, particularly our attitudes towards post-apocalyptic fiction as fantastical? Hmm. That's a great question. I think a silver lining, it, um, we might say, of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was uh, for, for me and I think for, for probably most of us in this room, one of the defining tragedies of our time, the silver lining was is that it woke us up to the relevance of, of uh, post-apocalyptic fantasy literature, especially its allegories, its symbolism, its metaphors. It allowed us to unpack the many layered meanings of plague. Plague can be literal disease, but it can also be figurative diseases of our society. Uh, and writers like Ellison and Richard Wright um, Lorraine Hansberry and the black existentialist tradition had movingly diagnosed those social diseases for us, but we often forget how deep those diseases run in our societies. And I think COVID-19 woke us up to the social justice problem that is social injustice <laughs> and uh, the diseases that perpetuate it. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that was a, a beautiful, impassioned talk. And uh, it feels like you've summoned the spirit of Mary Shelley into the room. Thank you. So my question is, you know, the word rebellion, uprisings and rebellions, as well as Mary, Mary Shelley, that brought me in here. Mm. And I'm curious, do you identify yourself as a rebel? And what do you feel uh, fantasy mm. in general is rebelling against? Mm -hmm. Or what would you hope it would rebel against more so? Mm. Uh, I think I do consider myself a, rebella, a rebel in the tradition of the British Romantics, uh, especially Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley has, uh, I think, been unfairly described um, in, um, in late 20th century literary criticism as a conservative. I think that's a, a, a terrible misreading of Mary Shelley's uh, both um, literary writings and uh, personal writings. If you read her diaries and journals, you know that Mary Shelley uh, identified with the, the leading progressive or what she would call liberal causes of the time. Um, she was deeply engaged with British politics of the period, knew many of the, politi many of the politicians and socialized with members of parliament. Um, and uh, she was passionate about many of the same causes her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was, including women's rights and abolition. Um, and uh, I think that um, today we can learn a lot from Mary Shelley's example, um, especially those of us interested in using literature, especially fantasy literature, as a metaphorical reservoir for dealing with social problems like racism and sexism. Uh, and I think she teaches us how we can use our literature as, a, as an allegory um, for engaging with the major social problems of our time. Uh, and if I had to say what my issue is, it's women's rights. Uh, and uh, coming from the United States, I am deeply disturbed uh, by the Dobbs decision of the Supreme Court, which has severely restricted abortion rights in my country and any, any form of reproductive freedom for, for women and men in, in, in our country. Uh, and um, although I was just very heartened to read in the paper before I flew over here that uh, uh, believe it or not, a judge in Texas just decided to grant a woman an exception to have an abortion during a very dangerous pregnancy um, that threatened both the, the life, the, the, the child um, that she uh, is pregnant with was in inevitably going to die. And um, if she was forced to bear it, it probably would have killed her or at the very least destroyed her fertility. And the judge gave her the right to, um, to, to go ahead and have an abortion. Um, so I think the, 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 the lesson Mary Shelley teaches us is that there's always hope. Even when things look really bleak and there's no future for something like the rights of black people or the rights of women, there's always hope. And there's always that one person out there whose mind can be changed, like that judge in Texas um, who can see the light and see reason. And I think Mary Shelley, like her mother, um, both um, who was schooled in the tradition of the Enlightenment, the idea that reason is a defining feature of the human being, Mary Shelley calls us to use our reason, use our imaginations to envision a better future for each and all. Thank you so much. I am so excited to have this on mic. 
Eileen's books are available. She'll be signing outside. The next session is Visualising Fantasy here at 2 o'clock. Don't miss it. Please enjoy the exhibition and the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eileen.